Welcome everyone to the first session of the CVR Industry Day. Uh, thank you very much for coming out. Uh, my name is Robert Wong. I'm with uh, Creative BC. We are the lead agency here in the province that, which is tasked with growing the creative industries throughout BC. So today I will be moderating a panel discussion titled VR, AR, MR in BC, our dynamic ecosystem. We have a very experienced group of experts that would, I would like to introduce introduce to you right now. So to my immediate left here, uh, we have Bill Tam, President and CEO of the BC Tech Association. Nancy Mott, Executive Director of the Film and Media Center at the Vancouver Economic Commission. We have James Hursthouse, Executive Director of DGBC, the Interactive and Digital Media Industry Association of British Columbia and owner of Greenstone Initiatives. Now, we were supposed to have Eduardo Di Martin, director of Microsoft Canada and the excellent center uh, here in Vancouver. Unfortunately, uh, due to the timing of our panel, we've had to ha uh, call in a pinch hitter. And I think we've actually called somebody really strong off the bench. Uh, it's Eric Kiss, founder of Funny Fox. Uh, please welcome my, my panelists here. Thank you. <clears throat> So I want to jump right into this uh, discussion here. You know, today we are trusted with uh, giving a snapshot of the AR, VR, MR industry here in BC. But as we see, saw uh, with uh, Evelyn Morales' uh, presentation uh, with, from NASA, you know, it, it, it touches a number of sectors. And so is it actually right to call this uh, as industry? Or are we, uh, is that a misnomer? James, let's start with you. Yeah, I guess, you know, my opinion on that one really is that uh, by calling the VR industry, you know, an industry, VR, MR, AR industry, uh, maybe it, it sort of doesn't quite do justice to the fact that this is really a new era of computing that we're about to embark on or that we're, you know, in the early stages of. Um, so, you know, in the same way that mobile devices now pretty much underpin every avenue of daily life from banking through medical, through absolutely everything, gaming, you know, is, is uh, you know, you can obviously engage with those areas through your mobile device. And, and the same thing I believe will happen with VR, AR and MR, uh, from my perspective, is actually a new platform. And by calling it an industry, I worry that it kind of pigeonholes people, you know, government obviously gonna look at an industry with things like uh, incentives and support. But, uh, you know, from my perspective, it would probably be better off for everybody if we started talking about how VR is the platform that's going to underpin pretty much everything moving forward. Um, I don't know if you guys would see the benefit from the industry label for a short period of time, but... Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I think of it more, uh, less an industry and more skill set. I think it, it does touch everything, but like other, other new technologies, computing in the old days, mobile when it popped up, it, it really is about knowing how to use this platform to its full extent, and that is it's unique and different enough that I think it counts as sort of an industry, but it's really about the skill set and understanding how to use that platform. So I, I think an industry is fine just because we all have the same problems to solve. Uh, and eventually we can diverge as we use those common set of solutions on our specific uh, problems that we're using them for. Yeah. I think it's, um, it's what we'd call part of the screen-based industries. I think we had to start lumping them all together because there's so many moving parts in that. And um, it's like calling an iPhone an industry. It's not. It's a platform in order for you to um, work better and live better. And eventually, VR will be integrated into our lives. It may, it's going to take some time because the hardware is not quite there yet. But um, yeah, definitely not, a, not an industry, I would say. Okay. So recently, I was reading an interview from um, the, uh, the Unity CEO who, who gave a presentation at the VRLA conference recently, and he talked about this gap of disappointment. Industry forecasters predict uh, that the, you know, AR and what they predict and what AR, VR companies are really experiencing in terms of monetization. You know, there's, there's this prediction that in three years' time, the VR, AR marketplace is going to exceed $164 billion there. A lot of buzz about this sector here in BC. Is this more hype, or is it really, or is it as strong as it is perceived to be this, you know, what we'll call this sector here in British Columbia? Bill? Well, I think um, every, every platform goes through, you know, that trough of disillusionment, right? So, 
uh, you know, when you kind of look at the long uh, term aspects of this, there's no question it's going to permeate every industry sector that's there. Uh, you, you guys are probably going to see a lot of applications that run from resources to healthcare to, uh, you know, how financial systems are going to work. So I, I think what you're kind of seeing early evidence of as people try different sorts of approaches to it is that they're still trying to experiment with where the initial application sets will be. But there's no question in my mind this is going to revolutionize everything. And Eric, would you agree with that, especially from a, a BC point of view? Yeah, it's, so I, I heard him say the exact same thing and he's 100% right. Uh, the problem with VR is that VR and mixed reality when people see it for the first time, they understand it, they get it. It's clearly revolutionary and clearly uh, a platform that changes a lot of, basically changes everything. The problem is, is you can't know that until you've been there. You can't read about it, you can't see a film about it, you can't, you can't see a demo on the web and understand how it's gonna work and how it's gonna change your life. Until you've done it, you can't see it. And, and you need shows like this to sort of, sort of ex expand people's understanding of this. And until it becomes mass market enough where everybody's showing it to their friend, uh, it, it is really going to take a time to ramp up. So I think he's right that it's it's going to be a much slower ramp, but it's going to accelerate quickly. So it's it's partly hype, but it's real hype. And I think it's just uh, I think the timing is different than what they're saying. I think the actual end goal, though, I mean everybody's going to have these things in ten years. Everybody. It's just do they start one year from now or six years from now? Right. But also, you know, I think it's important to remember that you know, technology or different industries typically have that phase where in the early stages the application is primarily industrial at least business to business i mean if you think back to the earliest days of flat screen televisions for example you know you used to see flat screen tvs in the lobbies of large companies because there was a utility for that but you know it took a number of years before the flat screen television became accessible to a consumer um, you know also in mid 70s the, the actually at the dawn of computing itself room size mainframes that you know people were willing to invest tens hundreds of millions of dollars into in order to save billions of dollars for example on things like credit card processing fees is a great example right so there's definitely an era where there's a very very lucrative business to be to be made created by addressing you know companies industrial applications for whom five thousand dollar headset or a hundred thousand dollar investment in something is not a blocker and you know, I think we're really in that era right now in VR. I don't expect it to be 10 to 15 years as it was in computing bet between the dawn of computers and the beginning of the home computing era. I think it will be a lot more compacted with this new VR AR space. But uh, nonetheless, I think if you're pursuing consumer, you're pursuing entertainment, maybe that's where the disappointment trough is. But I don't really see that disappointment gap in industrial applications that are saving hundreds of millions of dollars in processes. Uh, around things like construction and industrial design and all that kind of stuff. So, so is the industry here, as, you know, as we talk about the ecosystem and we're talking about the, the sector here, is it as strong as, and as, as it is perceived to be uh, by um, the stakeholders around? Yes, I think that um, we ha we're, we're uniquely positioned here because we have all the ingredients. We have um, a 40-year film and television industry. We have 30 years of visual effects and animation. We have 30 years of game development and a growing, um, thriving tech industry. And I, you need all those parts to make a whole. And I think that the, the, the reason it's difficult to call it an industry is because we have to get all those industries together and speaking to each other. And I think once we can start getting you know, the content creators to talk to the platform specialists and the CG artists to, to talk to the user interface experts, we're gonna see a lot more, um, a lot more things created. And of course, as we were talking about before, there is an adoption issue. I think the disappointment comes from people wanting it so badly. But let's face it, the hardware and software isn't there yet. The cost is prohibitive and it doesn't integrate into our lives. The reason, you know, PCs were so integrated into our lives so quickly is because we use them at work. We're not using VR on a daily basis, as to your point. We need to get that um, comfort level and usage going. And I think that, I think here we have everything to be really successful, yes. So, um, you know, if, if we here at the, in the province um, want to be a player or we are a player in it, um, I mean, what is that, what does that ecosystem need to look like in order to make sure that we become that industry leader or that, uh, that center of excellence that we want to be here in the province? I know we've invested a lot of money in, in, through, uh, through the technology, uh, through government, 
But what are, what are our strengths and what are our gaps that we're looking for? Maybe I'll start with Bill here. Sure, I'm happy to, because if you, as Nancy said, if you trace back the roots here, we have probably one of the most interesting intersection points of having creative and technology as a baseline for virtually everything that happens in British Columbia. Uh, in fact, I think if you were to count it, we probably have more sort of 3D artists, 3D sort of developers, people who can envision uh, the world in 3D than uh, a lot of the other places on Earth. And if Edo were here, we'd talk about, well, what were the uh, conditions under which Microsoft moved a bunch of their HoloLens development here? And he'd say exactly the same thing. Right? Yeah, it's, it's having the right talent and the right expertise to kind of bring that stuff together. Now, um, it takes a decade to kind of build the robustness in every one of the film industries and, and the creative industries. We see that. We see that in the industrial set, the business to business side. What gives us confidence that makes it unique for, for here in, in British Columbia is the fact that, as Nancy said, if we can actually apply some of the application sets that the industrial side needs, because that's going to be the early adoption side of some of this tech. They're the ones that are going to be able to afford the platform piece. They might not be wearing the, the VR piece every day, but, but for mission critical things that they're trying to evaluate, the simulation pieces that they need to do, we've actually got a really good baseline of the kind of companies that operate here that could really use that. If uh, you guys were at the BC Tech Summit a, a few weeks ago, there was a great demo on Goldcorp doing next generation mining using HoloLens. Yeah. And you can see that kind of application in a whole set of things that saves time, materials, and all sorts of things for corporates. And so I think for us to be a really great ecosystem is actually gluing together all those constituent parts and having kind of support mechanisms to grow the next generation talent to be that much more. Yeah, I, sorry, I just, I just sort of echo that, you know, as you, you know, go to various events and meet more sectors. I think potentially, you know, Bob, you talked about a gap. And I think it is really our sector's obligation to reach out to some of the other sectors in the province that have been here for many, many years, who've actually already been doing a lot of work in things like Internet of Things. And, you know, so there is technology underpinning things like forestry and, as you said, mining and, and all those sorts of things. I think really where we'll see some success is if we open up and say to some of the incumbent businesses that are in the province, this is how we really want to help you, right? And uh, you know, the other day we were doing a thing about the tech ecosystem where somebody said, wouldn't it be great if technology and mining, for example, could really bond together to figure out how to, you know, triple mining's revenues while halving their, you know, greenhouse emissions. Uh, and I think those kinds of dialogues are something that we should be uh, really keen on, uh, on doing uh, more than potentially we are right now, because I think that will actually bring together the whole ecosystem in a meaningful way for British Columbia. And because I have to say something, uh, so, so as a counterpoint though, because we have this talent pool that is so focused on film and video games and other entertain, entertainment media, uh, there's, it's almost like that's the hammer we have and so everybody wants to, to make a nail that is another entertainment product in VR and because it is such a consumer uh, light kind of industry right now, it is very corporate and business industry focused. That means that expertise, the people who make these games, who make these films, who have these creative talents, have to kind of think about how they can use those skills to solve these problems that make money for them. Because they're valid skills, they're absolutely needed. You need game pro programmers, you need people who understand real-time graphics, you need people who understand visual effects and user interface and all that important stuff, who, who, who have these skills, but you need to think about them less in the consumer market and more in the business user. And that's, those skills don't get wasted, they're absolutely necessary, but it's that mindset change that I think matters in the next few years anyway. Yeah, so that's, that's why I think it's so important to create these uh, connection points, these collision pieces. So Eric James and I have kind of worked on this, hatched this idea. If you guys go see, the, there's a booth um, called Cube that's uh, sort of a consortium of players who are trying to build up the next generation of AR and VR and MR kind of companies. We're going to have a space where all these sort of experiences can go beyond sort of the consumer VR piece and that the businesses can kind of see the kinds of things that are happening right here. And uh, as Eric said, we, we basically have to keep bridging those, uh, those divides. If we do that really well, we can make use of the expertise and actually apply it. Yeah, so the cube booth, it's over by the snack bar over the far, that far corner of the, of the hall. If you guys want to come and have a conversation afterwards, we'll pretty much be over there all day. So. Echoing everything that's being said, collaboration is key, and we have to work together to try and create that unified path. And we have to fail quickly together and have share successes at the same time in order for us to move forward quickly. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. 
So I'm going to throw out a kind of a, a fun question for you guys to, to think about. And um, tell me what you think, and we can, we can hash this around a bit. So if I had $10 million to give you to, start, to do a startup, what would you do in this space, this VR, AR, MR space? Well, first, I'd ask you how much of, your co of my company you're going to own first. <laughs> that aside, I don't know. Anyway, sorry, what was the question? <laughs> so, if I threw down $10 million in front of you right now to, start up, to, to create a startup, what would you do right now in this space? Who wants to start? Well, I'll, well, I'll start. You can go first. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sure, I'll start. Um, Okay, work, stay with me now. I would work in the porn industry. <laughs> the reason being is because of exactly what we were talking about. There is a huge demographic, early adopters in technology. They were the first on the internet. They were first for the microtransactions. And you need that pool of users in order to work through your processes. And so um, I just think it would be a, a drive the adoption model and move us quicker into... Um, Getting, getting, figuring out what the bumps are and, and moving it into a, a high, higher adoption rate overall. I thought we agreed we weren't going to bring up your past. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can see that that's trending on Twitter right now, Nancy, I'm telling you. It's just like, <laughs> interesting. Anyhow. Anybody would love to follow up on that? I, so I have a glib answer, which is like, I would go and make the Ready Player One game because, uh, you know, it's already predicted the future. I would be the richest man in the world uh, 20 or 30 years from now. Uh, but I also know that that's unlikely to succeed anytime soon. That thing's probably going to happen sometime in the next 20 years, but not soon. So again, I'd, I'd be super practical. That's my mindset. I'd go off and, and, and work with an industry, one that you're passionate about. My personal preference is medical industry, uh, and find a way to use virtual reality and mixed reality to change the way we heal people and, uh, and help humanity. I think it's both you know, it's good, it's a, an actual ethical good, but at the same time, it's also likely to be very lucrative and very quickly adopted. It's, it's clearly a better way of doing things, and figuring out how to do that soon is, uh, is important, and I think $10 million is about the right sum of money. Okay. Yeah, well, I'm not sure that I could get all the way with $10 million, but at least, you know, I think from my perspective, there's a lot of things that happen, you know, on desktop, on mobile today. You know, things like... Uh, WordPress and Wix, for example, is you know, how do you create a website easily and all of those things that ended up kind of democratizing some of those processes for those platforms, right? And so I think starting off looking at what that means in the 3D space, like, you know, because people eventually, I don't know what the time frame is, but within five to 10 years, potentially, people are going to want to be able to put together a, a simple VR-based experience for their product or what have you in the same way that somebody would come along to Wix or WordPress today. So I think kind of like those self-help website de development tools for this new era of computing is pretty interesting. So. Bill? I'd take that $10 million, and I would actually invest five of it in uh, Finger Food Studios. It's Ryan, Ryan Peterson's company. <laughs> <laughs> Does aw awesome sort of simulations and, and sort of stuff on uh, industrial design for uh, trucking companies, for aviation companies. I would invest $5 million with uh, with Ryan at Finger Food. And I'd spend, I would invest $5 million with the Angela at Conquer Mobile, who's trying to do that kind of stuff on healthcare and, sims and simulations for sort of the nursing industry. So that's where I would put my money. Excellent. Well, you know... So it's Bob's money. <laughs> that's my money. money. Exactly. Yeah. I do get a say in what you do with that money there. Um, before I throw, go back to with another question, I was just wondering if there's any uh, questions out there in the audience, uh, anybody who want to step up to the mic and ask these uh, experts here on anything to do with the ecosystem here? Well, feel free to just step up the mic when you want to there. You know, we've been talking about the ecosystem and how in here in British Columbia, how dynamic it is, how strong it is. We've talked about some gaps, we've talked about some, some of the strengths there. You know, again, kind of waving your wand, what's that one thing that, what, first thing that we need to change or need to do or can do better in order to sort of take the, take the ecosystem one step higher here in the province? I, I think it's a bit of a summation of what we've all talked about. I think if we could find a way to be the most collaborative ecosystem to kind of bridge all these pieces, the components that make us great on an individual basis, 
it's kind of the whole uh, village thing, right? So if we can kind of work together as a village, we're going to kind of give birth to a whole bunch of great companies. Um, the, you know, the, the amazing ride on tech broadly, not just in the AR, VR, and, and the entertainment creative side, but for every subsector, we probably have like a dozen different subsectors that have forged what we call the technology baseline for British Columbia. And, and in the last decade, it has just taken off. There's over 100,000 people that work in the sector now, and there's some fantastic companies that have come out from that. But it took a long time to get there. And the reason it took a long time was because everyone was kind of working off on their own stuff. But if there's a way to kind of combine it, I, I'm confident that we can actually make it go a lot faster. I think we need to um, focus on the human experience. If we're thinking that um, these devices are going to replace the iPhone, if you think about how much you um, rely on your iPhone, you'll drive back to your house if you forgot it, you know, things like that, like how do we, how do we create the human experiences in these new devices that make them invaluable? I think that's kind of the long-term goal of VR, AR, MR um, for, for the high adoption. I think, I think, actually, there's two things. One is, uh, is a better connection with, uh, with our higher education systems, making sure that there's programs in place that are researching and developing this kind of technology, because it is new enough that I think the universities that we've got, we've got great universities, great talent coming out of them, but they, we need to refocus their efforts on this new stuff as opposed to the old mobile space and the old web space, which are all fine and dandy, but are a little more solved problems. And then last but not least is, uh, is the money. We need money, we need the investment environment that they've got down in Silicon Valley. They got a ton of money flying around there, being invested in companies with little or no promise, but they haven't got the talent pool that we have. Silicon Valley is great for making your next Facebook and your next Uber, but they're not really focused on, on real-time frame rates and, and, and high quality graphics. They're, they're stuck in their old little ecosystem. We've got the people up here, but we haven't got those connections and we haven't got that money. And if there were people wandering around giving $10 million to me, <laughs> I would be a much happier man. And I think there would be a lot more companies that were, would be willing to take that risk and to jump into VR and AR and mixed reality to do these new innovative things if there was somebody who was backing them because they understood that potential and that five to 10 year horizon of, of, of some of these payoffs. Yeah, I, I think from a really, really practical perspective, uh, one suggestion would be, I mean, obviously this show itself, I mean, it's great, right? Last year, I, you know, I, couldn't make it, I was out of the country, but I hear that this is what, tripled in size now? So I mean, if everybody here brings five people next year and we do a real concerted effort to get those investors to come here from Silicon Valley and we get you know, more of that interaction between the industrial side, you know, maybe it can be 15 times bigger than it was last year by this time next year. Um, I do think that you know, consumer VR as a, as a label, really focusing in on that consumer piece, may be slightly premature. So, why not co you know, run co consumer VR with industrial VR together at the same time and make this the biggest show in the world for VR uh, within a kind of three-year period, right? So. Well, thank you very much. Uh, do we have any questions out there? I have one question. Um, this question I'd like to open to everyone, but particularly uh, about uh, Nancy. You mentioned about the human experience for the fastest uh, possible adoption because technology without the human touch still uh, does not mean anything. And uh, but very, very interesting. Yesterday, I was uh, actually stopped by at a bus stop and uh, I'm asking someone, do you know what virtual reality is? And uh, she don't really say, I really don't know what virtual reality and augmented reality is. But you know what she said to me? I know something called I've heard of a virtual brothel. So I find it's very, very interesting as to uh, uh, what does it mean to the human experience because Tom Early, you listen to his speech, he's talking about uh, uh, a human experience. We are, we are or actually, I believe that we are, or are not a human having a spiritual experience, but a spiritual being having a human experience. So if you have a $10 million going to uh, Robert, what are you saying? If there is one superhero role, if there's one person you'll be created right now at this, what will be that person's title will be, and what will be his mission in the next three years? Not number five, not number three, but 12 months. What will that person critical role will be and be kick ass at this moving forward? 
a title of a person that, that would pre create the human experience? Uh, yes, for, for, for moving uh, the support. Expert user interface uh, technician. <laughs> Chief, Chief virtual human experience reality yeah. officer, probably. I don't know. I didn't quite understand the question. So. Is that what you mean? I don't quite. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 somebody who is going to understand how to create, how to create a connection to, to draw somebody in. And uh, you're going to need someone who understands the pieces, and then you're going to need a technical wizard to create the devices. Does that, does that uh, yeah, and yeah. Uh, any, any other, from another pa panel, like James or Eric? I don't know. I just sort of generally look at this. It was interesting. I was at my son's Little League game, I think, last Sunday, and there were a couple of moms behind sort of talking about screen time and worried about, you know, people being immersed. and. And I sort of turned around and said, well, you know, 200 years ago, people would be worried about kids going down the mines, right? And so in a way, there's always these things that people are going to be worried about. Um, so I think, I don't know if the point that you're trying to make is that actually human experience can be enhanced and we can actually reach new levels of kind of consciousness and connectivity as humans because of the fact that we have this technology available. Is that kind of what you're driving at? Because I believe that that's true. I think when you look at the iPhone and you, you look at that little device that gives you access to every piece of human wisdom since the beginning of time, which is a great thing and a bad thing at the same time, but nonetheless, oh, I'm not gonna let you have access to your phone as a punishment, which is actually saying, I'm not gonna let you have access to the entire collected knowledge of the human race for two hours, right? <laughs> yeah. Doesn't seem like a punishment to me, but there you go. So, I mean, I think it's interesting. It's, some of it is actually about the visionary application of this stuff and saying, well, you know, if you can go to a, a football game with a million of your closest friends, isn't that a fabulous thing, right? In terms of driving forward world peace and things like that. So I don't know. I mean, I think chief visionary officer in this space is actually really still very, very important. And uh, yeah. Thanks know. very much for your question. I have one question over here. Uh, um, Sir. Jesus. I'll stand back here. OK. All right. Well, we can't uh, hear you now. <laughs> So uh, the question I have is, what are the challenges we face around infrastructure for being able to adopt this technology? So with television, we had television networks, cell phones, we had cell networks, the internet had you know, all the infrastructure required to be able to have all the pops around the world to connect to. What are the challenges that we face around the building out the infrastructure to really um, you know, explode in VR? So the question was that, uh, what are the challenges around building around, uh, of the infrastructure? What are the infrastructure uh, challenges that we have here in, at British Columbia? Uh, well, so there's, there's a bunch of things. And one of them, and then this is, the challenges are actually the same ones that are keeping it out of consumer hands. And it's the fact that the equipment is bulky, it's expensive, it's tethered for the most part. The highest fidelity experiences are the most complex to use. The easiest to use experiences are not very high quality. So. Uh, technological advance is one part. We need we need Hololens. Uh, we need a Hololens type device that can do uh, can do Vive type quality. We need that to be something that you can carry around on your face without feeling embarrassed, and it needs to be something that's uh, two hundred bucks or less. And they can't mess your hair up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's you know there, there's a ton of technical advancement that needs to happen. Uh, there's also going to be a bandwidth issue. There's a lot more fidelity needed for the kinds of experiences you have in, in, in virtual reality and mixed reality that you don't need on mobile. So obviously bandwidth growth is going to be important. Uh, the good news is that seems to be happening anyway. Uh, it, it really comes down to the hardware itself. I think, I think the infrastructure that exists today is 90% of what we need other than the actual devices and the hardware and the software that goes with it. Thank you. Um, we're running short on time here, so I just want to thank my panelists, uh, Eric Kiss, James Hursthouse, Nancy Mott, Bill Tam, I'm Robert Wong. Thank you, CRV, for inviting us there. Thank you very much.